I want to welcome you all to NGL's Engage and Exchange video discussion series on navigating the Bureau of Prisons. We are happy to have joining us uh, Mr. Jack Donson, who's the Executive Director of the Federal Prison Educational and Reform Alliance, along with uh, Patricia Cresta Savage, who is the chair of our Corrections Committee. And they're going to go over the updates to how to navigate the prison system guide. Um, just some housekeeping. If you have questions, we ask that you type them into the chat and um, Pat and Jack will answer them as they come up um, and as they, they feel is appropriate. But we do want this to be interactive and we do want you to have the opportunity to ask questions. So feel free to throw those questions in the chat as we go along and they will pick them up um, as, as they go along. This program will be re recorded and you'll be notified once it's available for viewing and sharing. Um, we are happy to offer this event for both members and non-members, but we do encourage you to join NACDL because you have opportunities to see all of our engaging exchanges, which are some of them are behind the paywall. Um, so if you are enjoying this program and you'd like to learn more, we will drop our um, membership opportunity down in the chat and um, you can follow up with our membership. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Patricia, who can also tell you all the great things about NACDL and what they'll be covering today. Thank you very much, Monica. And thank you to NACDL for sponsoring this. Uh, I have been a member for decades. I urge you all, if you aren't a member of NACDL, to become a member. Uh, the publications, trainings, meetings, and camaraderie uh, that, that we have as a result of our membership is something that improves your practice, and I urge you to join. Uh, I am Pat Cresta Savage. I am chair of the Corrections Committee. Uh, I have, I'm also a former board member of NACDL. Uh, the Corrections Committee has a mission statement. In sum, it's to promote safe and humane conditions for prisoners and to promote policy to make sure that that is accomplished. Back in October 2023, uh, there was a listening session sponsored by the Bureau of Prisons in which we met the new director, Colette Peters, uh, and we were able to uh, provide her uh, NACDL's feedback on what needed to happen to improve the prison system. On August 29th, 2023, a letter was sent to Lisa Monaco, uh, Deputy Attorney General, as well as to Colette Peters, the now director, regarding access to counsel. This is a huge issue. The access to counsel letter included a proposal for a legal access advisor, which is essentially a help desk, uh, to field calls from over the country to schedule visits and or confidential phone calls with clients. We're going to address some of that here in our program today. While there are current BOP policies regarding telephone regulations and legal activities, the BOP does not have a uniform system, unfortunately. And for those of you who have clients or family members or are, are across the country, you know how hard it is to contact uh, your client and set up confidential calls. Richard Willstadt, a committee member from New York, met on behalf of NACDL with the Marshal Service as a result of this letter to discuss needed changes regarding the pretrial system and discovery. And again, special thanks to Lisa w uh, Wayne, the esteemed executive director of NACDL, and Kyle O'Dowd, who reviewed the correspondence and participated in the effort. Back on March 10th, 2021, the Corrections Committee prepared and uploaded to the website the How to Navigate the Prison System Guide. Uh, it's an ever-changing document, and we'll learn about that today, but we know how daunting it can be to navigate the prison system. Practitioners and their families alike need to better understand what happens to their client or family member when they're arraigned and are indicted and then detained pretrial in addition to what happens during trial sentencing and post-conviction and re uh, upon re-entry. Their lives are in the hands of BOP employees who make decisions regarding classification, des designation, and placement. Um, the Co Corrections Committee, all members, have worked zealously um, with the many changes that are taking place, and they're numerous. Uh, Mr. Jack Donson, who is a member of the committee and known to many of you, worked for the BOP for over 36 years. 
he now serves as an expert to both clients and the court system to better assist clients navigate the system during pretrial trial, sentencing, and post-conviction. He is currently the executive director of the Federal Prison Education and Reform Alliance, uh, an organization designed to assist practitioners clients and family members on all things BOP. For those of you who work on compassionate release cases, uh, sentence reduction and second look act cases, Mr. Donson can support you in reviewing BOP records, including disciplinary education, pattern scoring and good and earned time credit, just to name a few. The purpose of today's presentation uh, which is the first of three that we're going to provide to you with basic information about the BOP uh, for the life of the case and beyond. The next two presentations after this will include a review of medical treatment from Dr. Diane Summers, medical doctor recently retired from the BOP, and from one of our committee members, Jacqueline Hall, from Wired for Addiction regarding uh, drug treatment and evaluation and sentencing recommendations. Uh, also, our own Elizabeth Blackwood uh, from NACDL and, and Allison Guernsey, professional, uh, I'm sorry, professor of clinical programs from Iowa University School of Law, will be presenting on First Step Act, Good Time and Earned Time Credit. We hope you enjoy this presentation and find it useful in your practice and for your families. We encourage questions and participation as the session will be recorded and we appreciate knowing about your stories and specific areas of interest. We have a lot to cover, so we'll do our best in the allotted time and we'll begin our presentation. And so I'll turn it over to you, Jack. Yeah, I just need to qualify 35 years. It was 23 with the BOP and the last like 13 have been in the private sector. I have to make that distinction because, you know, you're inside the system with one perspective. It's a whole new perspective. You know, I like I jumped the fence as far as the staff say. Um, and so the last 12 years have been privately supporting mostly federal defenders, to be honest with you, and uh, testifying around the country and any anything BOP, really. And a lot of pro bono work with for people in prison and families. So I guess it's time to really open up the guide. And we can actually you know, spend an hour on one or one sub, like, you know, every subject, if you want to dig down deep, we could spend an hour, but we thought we would just, you know, go through slowly the up, the updates, so to speak. All we, all we really did was remove certain, certain data, updated the links to the most basic, uh, most updated policies and things like that. And so I'm going to try to provide a lot of practice tips from my perspective as we go through this. So if we want to just start to scroll through and get through the beginning, the index and go to the, which is the first important uh, link I want to show you and open, which is the legal resource guide. I frequently talk to people and they don't know this resource guide exists. This is a, a if I was a practitioner, I would have this uh, printed and at my desk, because it's a soup to nuts, like we have our guide, which is actually more detailed, more link centric. But this is a comprehensive soup to nuts legal guide that the Bureau of Prisons has developed for practitioners. So even though it's 2019, you know, a majority of this is applicable and it's just a great resource. And so anybody that doesn't know it exists, I highly recommend you keep this resource at your fingertips. So, Jack, just so you know, they're asking for a link to the guide. Um in the chat, we will we will be doing that. The link is in the navigating the prison system guide. So in other words, that's why everybody's gonna use our... Okay, just so you know, this is on the NACDL website and we will, we will give you a link to that. Absolutely. And so then if you'll go back to the, to the guide itself, and then the next thing I'll talk about a little bit is this is pretty significant because the BOP updated after many years, the pretrial policy. And so this is going to be applied to all policies. When the BOP puts out what's called program statements and updates the program statements, there's always a summary of changes in the beginning. So basically you want to focus on the summary of changes, especially if you're already 
aware of the policy and have been working under the policy. You really just want to focus on what they're telling you has changed. And can you click on that as well, just to show you the summary of changes in the uh, pretrial policy? And scroll down and right to this very first section. Now there's a lot here. We could spend a half hour just on the changes. I mean, they definitely differentiated uh, the portable alien versus excludable alien. And they, they put some interesting things in here. But anyway, just as just, you know, the focus when you're looking at any, any BOP policy that's changed. Can you go back up to the first page? I wanna point something else out. You know, this might be simple or premature or, or, or very, you know, very basic, but the purpose and scope is direct CFR language. So BOP policies always have the bolded print. In my experience working for the agency, many times they'd say, you know, they, they, they would say we have a lot of discretion within the policy. So they weren't really concerned other than when it came to the CFR. And I explained this sort of like the BOP folds like a cheap umbrella when they're outside the scope of the CFR. So our policy makes those distinctions. And it's important when you're analyzing a case, are they in violation of that? Or are they in violation of the regular policy? They should be the regular language. They should be following all of it, to be honest with you. But they really are super sensitive, especially during the administrative remedy process of adhering to the CFR language. And you can go back to the guide. Thank you. So Pat, um, as we move through, do you have any as, do you have any questions on on pretrial in general, or is there anything coming from the chat group? Hold on. I don't see any specific questions regarding uh, pretrial. However, uh, perhaps you can talk a little bit about the recent meeting uh, and and how the Bureau of Prisons is dealing with pretrial uh, classifications, et cetera. Well, well, let me say this. Uh, most people are aware that the designated facilities have what's called a program review process. They do initial classification upon arrival. They do six month program review meetings, recommend programs. A lot of people aren't aware that even in the pretrial world, and this is not new, pretrial inmates also get an initial screening and similar to an in, uh, initial classification. And they also get regular 90 day program reviews. And we have those two, you don't have to click on them, but the two forms I'm referencing are right there on that page four at the top. And that's the actual form that shows you what happens when somebody first comes into the prison and then what happens every 90 days. That data is available actually for their disclosure and sometimes you could use that maybe for a sentencing if they are doing programming. Now, pretrial facilities obviously are limited on programming, but there are things going on. So sometimes maybe you could accentuate, you know, something from the own data created by the people, you know, re receiving these, these, these reviews. And there is a question regarding SOPs, Standard Operating Procedures at Facilities. Um, is there, are there standard operating procedures and uh, is there a forum for in, inmates to advocate for change? And what are the mechanisms or events that generally generate updates to SOPs at facilities? Well, the, the, the facility never uses like the word SOPs. Like here's what it is. All facilities have to conform to national policy. They're the program statements. Institutions can have what's called institution supplements, but they're only mandated to have institution supplements on certain directives. And so if you're talking about local policy, uh, listen, there's very little input taken from the inmate population within the Bureau of Prisons, to be honest with you. Um, that, that's just the way it is as far as, you know, internal procedures. So why don't you talk a little bit about the interaction with the U.S. Marshal Service? Well, pre that's the other thing, too. Pretrial inmates are really not a Bureau of Prisons prisoner. Pretrial inmates are responsibility of the marshal service. So like a first, just say an emergency 
uh, furlough request comes up, death of immediate family member, the Bureau of Prisons doesn't have the authority and, and apply the furlough program statement because they're a marshal's prisoner. That would actually have to come by way of a court order. Now, so you always have to keep that in mind, marshal prisoner versus BOP prisoner. To, to get a little technical within the system, you might have heard the term pretrial holdover designated. Uh, in the computer system, the way everything is coded, a pretrial is a, a admissions and release status computer assignment is A-pre, pretrial prisoner. Once the government has uh, official notice of a conviction, they technically become a holdover, A-HLD. That's a little different. Now, the you know, they're not really a pretrial anymore because, remember, pretrial inmates do have a little bit more rights when it comes to working and, and they have to ex exercise a work waiver. You know, and there's a little bit more uh, rights, I would say, with a pretrial prisoner. But anyway, the holdover becomes somebody convicted, official notice, and then obviously sentence, there may remain a holdover. And when they arrive at their first designated institution, the assignment changes to A-DES. So you have pretrial holdover designated. And then there's also other kinds of assignments, like there's an, an administrative facility, you might have AMAT, a material witness, believe it or not, you know, things like that. So they're not just those three assignments, there's multiple ARS type assignments. So we do have a question, it's sort of pre-trial as well as uh, trial related. Uh, how do you change a designation? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about designations in a little while. That's a, that is very nuanced, uh, uh, you know, that's a very nuanced situation, very case specific. And we will talk about that more a little in the guide. Uh, and if you're, well, let me, let me say this. I assume now you're talking about a pre-trial prisoner finds out where they're designated. And now before they arrive, you want to change it. Maybe exactly. that's, and that's guys. So let me address that a little bit. Grand Prairie does not revisit designations. That That's just the bottom line. They're processing them by the thousands. Uh, they're very clear. Uh, they don't look back. Now, that being said, there are little nuances and there are times we've had designations changed and it could be, this is from Grand Prairie staff. If the court will amend or update a judicial recommendation, it could be by way of a, of a one letter, one page motion. We've been lucky to change them from time to time by the judge, prosecutor not objecting, judge actually signing a modified recommendation. And, and again, it's non-binding. They don't have to change it, but there are little nuances. That's a conversation really to have off of the training, it, uh, it would just be too time consuming to explain other little nuances that happen with change in designations, but it's it's difficult at best. Is there a way uh, to change the designation prior to self-surrender? Well, well, that's what we're talking about, to be honest with you. Well, give me a live case example. I'm going to, in a little while, I'm going to speak about pre-sentence reports and classification. So I like to use the example of working with a white collar guy in his 50s, Assuming camp, that's a dangerous assumption usually too, unless you know the classification system, gets a surrender letter to a secure facility. You know, immediately I look at the pre-sentence report is obviously when they reach out and, and believe that this is crazy, but we're going to talk practice tips. The BOP is very conservative on scoring classifications. In this particular case, the person had like a 1980 something Assault, drunken, disorderly, Atlantic City, unknown disposition. Now, here we are like 20, 30 years later. He's a white collar guy. It's actually was uh, it was an alcoholic back in the 80s, but he was like 30 years sober. And they literally were designating him to a secure facility based on that old charge with an unknown disposition. This is a case we actually were able to change it because we literally had to send a courier to Atlantic City to track down the, de the, the, the the disposition. And we are able to get an amended recommendation. And again, the BOP does not have to change it. They just have to look at it again when it comes from the court and through the EDES system. And they actually changed the designation and did the right thing, to be honest with you. But those situations are rare, very case specific. So that's, you know, you can change them. Sometimes it could be a medical issue. You know, I, I, I don't want to get too much in it, but you're making me think of some like valuable information where 
A lot of times it's a medical issue. For instance, just say it's a medical center designation and six months have gone by and the medical condition has changed. If you can get updated medical information to the BOP, they will, and I'll talk about the care levels in a little while, they will look at it and they really don't want people in medical centers who don't need to be because of the shortage of bed space. So you could flip sometimes if it's a medical des and the medical necessity is not present anymore. And so there's all kinds of little case specific things, but don't, don't think it's easy and don't think it's automatic or it's going to happen. Uh, it's very nuanced stuff that you really, you know, have to be aware of the situation, look at a policy and then you know, try to do the best you can. So uh, there is another question. Um, what is required to go from pretrial to BOP custody? Does it require a filed written judgment or just the judge announcing uh, sentence at the sentencing hearing? Can you repeat that one more time? Well, it says what is required to go from pretrial to BOP custody? Does it require a filed written judgment? Let's start with that. I don't really know what that question means. I Does mean, the pre- judge have to issue an order. The judge is going to issue a sentencing order. Is the only order he's going to issue. There's no order other. The legal piece of paper holding a body in prison is what's called a marshal's remand, and that's an a pre. Mm-hmm. When the BOP receives official notification of a conviction, that could be as simple as the marshals through some bringing somebody back from court. They become a a hold. The only thing that they're going to get from the judge after that is going to be the sentencing order, the AO245 order that gets uploaded into the EDES system, and then the whole designation process starts. So it's not like a, a piece of paper is needed from a judge from a pre, you know, from a from a facility. Okay. If, you, if you're talking about if you're talking about somebody in a contract pretrial county jail facility with the marshals who maybe subsequently got sentenced. That's a whole different animal because it's not a BOP prisoner initially. And the marshals have, you know, usually on sentencing, they put them to a second holding contract that's more of a hub until they get their designation to the final BOP facility. So I'm not quite 100% sure of the question exactly. Well, I I have a a question. As a practitioner, it seems to me in... uh, there are several points in time where you need to assist your client complete the forms. Can can that be done at pretrial? I know there's a pretrial intake form because sometimes, you know, our clients don't understand what form they're completing or why. And so I think we need to be clear with them as to how important it is to complete the information. And you're talking BOP forms? Yeah, I'm talking the screening. The uh, BOP. There, 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 there's a myriad. There's, there's many, many BOP okay. forms that are generated and take screening on. All of the forms, believe it or not, are on the internet. They're on the BOP website under the forms, uh, you know, tab link. And okay. so, and your and your question is what they are executed by staff. Why don't you go into the form and just show and uh, as an example the pretrial form? Well. There's more. Here's what if we want to back all the way up to intake screening. They're going to fill out a medical assessment with the medical intake screener. That's basically like your first visit to a doctor, to be honest with you, if you're going to go right back to the beginning. That's just a medical intake screening form. There's also going to be a psychological what they refer to as a PSIQ uh, psychology services intake questionnaire. That's going to be more psychological history, substance abuse, you know, all the, they do an ACEs. Part of PSIQ is an ACEs survey, believe it or not. The 10, I think it's 10 ACEs questions at the end. I mean, that's another form. The BOP form from a case management perspective, every person before they hit a general population has to sign, the BOP refers to it as a PP64 intake screening form. That form assesses safety. Have you cooperated against anybody? Have you testified against anybody? Are you a member of a gang? Uh, Have you ever been sexually assaulted? Have you recently been sexually assaulted? These are the actual questions. Um, Is there any reason why you cannot go to the general population? You know, simple as that. That's your primary case management intake screening form. Then you have things called 407s and 408s, which is next to kin notification, disposition of property. Pat, the forms go on and on and on, believe it or not. The and the pretrial and the pretrial status, they go into what's called a drop folder. And believe it or not, inmates have access to drop folders to review them. It's like 
poking your eye out to get that process to work. But there are there are a drop file. The drop file materials will move with the body to the designated institution that become the core documents for what's called the inmate central file. But I think we should probably move along a little bit because again, we could talk an hour about forms in itself. Let's let's roll through to the next big section, which I would like to talk about, which is the designation process. And I have a lot of practice tips for the pre-sentence actually first. The, uh, I do training all over the country. Um, I, lit, I was in Florida recently with Elizabeth Kelly. We had an audience of uh, the participants were predominantly senior USPOs over the pre-sentence unit. And I'm telling you, even federal probation officers don't really have a good understanding of BOP policy classification and programs. I'm totally disappointed with the level of understanding. I usually have them raise their hand, answer simple questions. Very disappointed in government servants that were supervisors over a pre-sentence unit don't understand basic things. So well, wanted... two things I would say about that. It's important, it's incumbent on a, a practitioner to be present when their their client is being interviewed. And then I believe under the rules, you have two weeks to review the PSR um, and make changes because whatever is in that PSR is going to be is very important. Well, listen, I'm going to talk right now, big ticket items. If you had to take any notes up until now, you need to take some of these notes because these themes play out over and over from when I came in the system in the 80s until like last week. Unknown dispositions in a pre-sentence report is considered a detainer by the Bureau of Prisons. They broadly look at things, ambiguous dispositions, and they overclassify. You know, I, what they'll say on the record is what they say. What I see all over the country, what I experienced my whole career, you don't want unknown dispositions, even if it's in the other conduct section. That'll become a detainer, uh, an unknown disposition. This might sound this might sound like I'm embellishing, but I'll, you know, the BOP classification system, which we'll talk about next is a point system and public safety factors that determine a security classification. So the, the analogy I like to use is 23 points is the threshold of medium, 24 points is high security. If a person alleges they have a GED and the probation doesn't verify it because many pre-sentence reports saying school was contacted pending verification, self-reports don't count. So if that, that's two points. So if the person literally scores as a 23 and nobody verifies the GED, they're going to a penitentiary. And to be honest with you, that's profound difference. A uh, high security penitentiary with the, with the gang activity, everybody's carrying sharpened instruments for self-protection. That's a whole different world than a medium. Mediums are rough, don't get me wrong, but they're more respectable, they're more manageable. And so the simple lack of verifying a GED could result in a penitentiary placement unnecessarily. And I'm being dramatic, but it's true. And I've seen it over and over again. Sometimes some states let you call an 800 number to verify it, believe it or not. So like probation, in my opinion, has to do a better job. But obviously people should advocate for their clients and you know try to bring the, the actual diplomas or the GED certificates to that interview to prove it as well. And, and I might add, uh, for those of you that do that are engaged in compassionate release work, the judges review the disciplinary records, the education records, the pattern scores, the risk assessments, the security levels. And if your client is in a penitentiary, it's next to impossible to obtain the training that they need to, to for, toward rehabilitation. The other issue is once the designation's done and you get to your designated institution, you could immediately bring proof to the staff, but they're going to give you that 18 months clear conduct before transfer business or slap what's called a population management variable on you, or there's a lot of little discretionary things they can do, but doesn't mean they're going to turn right around and transfer somebody. Something else important to pay attention to is, and again, some of these things might sound silly, but they're not, legal address on the pre-sentence report. When people talk about the 500 miles, it's by the legal address on the pre-sentence report. I had a case once where they couldn't they, they couldn't figure out why they were designated to Texas because they weren't from Texas. They were from like the Northeast. 
and believe this is crazy. Believe it or not, they had a prior period of incarceration in Texas federal. And because Century, the database, doesn't flush the data, when the new case came and they were loading the new designation and information from the pre-sentence report, the, the, the designation officials were just not paying attention to detail. And they literally left the legal residents from the 1980s in the database. And when the BOP designator hits a button, the facilities closest to that zip code pop up. And the person was designated to Texas based on a, a faulty zip code. Uh, really, I mean, that's not common, but they're just things to be aware of. And that case, we were able to change. See, they're the cases where, you know, if you understand what went wrong and you have the time and everything, like things like that can be flipped, you know, because that's just the right thing to do. There's really no comeback for that. And is it is a court order at that point or a recommendation, I should say, a recommendation for placement honored by the BOP? Well, I don't want to use that particular case. The, the BOP. No, well, well no, the BOP, I, I attend the USSC training every time the BOP presents, which was in Los Angeles a few months ago. The BOP's company line has been pretty consistent over the years. They, they track, they absolutely track compliance and they track it that 70% compliance was the stat they use this year. They usually use a stat that's a little higher. Um, they're a little bit disingenuous in the stat because if they recommend a program and a facility, they take 100% compliance for only like partial compliance. They take full credit for partial compliance, but they look at it. They try. The bigger point is you can't make a facility recommendation without having some ideas of the classification system and program needs. Because I see impractical recommendations made all the time because somebody heard a place was good. I made an assumption. And, you know, if you don't know what the classification is, you know, like you're really just sh shooting in the dark. I use the example of I had a doctor call me once, assume they're going to a camp. And I'm like, they, they got a letter, letter to surrender to a private ICE contract facility. They're from Miami. The facilities in Texas, private ice contract. Mm -hmm. I looked at the preset and it's within a minute. Another crazy thing. Canadian citizen came as a teenager. Here he is, a 50 some year old doctor, alien public safety factor. He never got US citizenship. Whether you jumped over the wall yesterday or whether you're a Canadian that came as a teenager, if you're not a citizen, there's only one public safety factor. The, with the public safety factors is they override the security scoring and they elevate the level. So uh, somebody with an alien public safety factor cannot be housed in a camp. In this case, they treated him like a, a nice prisoner to go to a contract facility in Texas. So anyway, uh, like. Here's a question, Jack. Uh, I have a client. Well, it's a anecdote as well. I have a client who was sentenced in June 2022 and the court ordered that the PSR be corrected to, to show that he was a U.S. citizen, not deportable, but this was never done. In addition, because he's schizophrenic, the court recommended Devins or in the alternative Butner. As a result of this error, the, this Brooklyn-based client was designated to CTAC because he was deemed deportable the corrected PSR was ultimately sent to SeaTac in Grand Prairie in February 2023, but he's still in a SeaTac today and continues to be denied programming. How do we fix this? Listen, the, the, you have you have three at least three separate issues here, and I'm going to take them one at a time. And I mean, I'm I I feel like we're kind of not progressing through the manual like we should, but I also feel this is valuable and you're bringing up a lot of good points where people are probably hopefully learning something. And so I'm gonna take the one I deal with a lot. Don't recommend a medical center unless you're 100% sure it's a care level three classification, either mental or physical health. You can't make, you can't make it enough. If you do know that, that's fine. But there are wasted recommendations if you're making an assumption he's medic, he's, I, I assume you mean he's psychological care level, uh, mental health care level three. If he's not mental health care level three, you can recommend Devins and Butner all you want. They're not going to a 
uh, not going to a medical center, to be honest with you. And they're even more tighter or, you know, like it's, it's even more difficult to become a mental health care level three than it is to be a physical care, care level three. I see that all the time where people assume uh, they're going, to, they need medical center placement. So this is a, probably a good time to point out, which is in our guide, aside from the various BOP policies that get into the definitions of care levels, the BOP also has on the website, and we, we're linked to it, cl clinical guides that are not even policy. They're actually clinician guides, and there's one on the care levels. It kind of explains medical, mental health. There's a little algorithm in the back, and there's all kinds of good information. So that's what I mean. If you don't know the classification program, mental health and medical needs, you're just picking facilities that you think might be appropriate. So that was the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I want to say is even more profound. At sentencing, if there's disputes about accuracies in the pre-sentence report, the court is required to fill out what's called a, 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 state, a statement of reasons. Every AO245 judgment has a corresponding statement of reasons. And on that form is where it should be checked. The court adopts the factual findings of the pre-sentence report except and that's where the court personnel are supposed to type out those issues, changes, because that is a core document that the BOP gets. It, they won't release it to the person. It's a, it's, a free to, it's a FOIA document. It's not disclosable. But um, you need to make sure the statement of reasons is accurate to correct those things in the pre-sentence report. So I'm going to assume that process played through, and then later on, the judge ordered it corrected. You know, and that 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 that's the least uh, effective way. So, if you're telling me, why? Well, well the, the, if you're telling me somebody's in CTAC and he's and the, and he's there because of only because of deportation, and he's not deportable, I mean, you know that that that's that's difficult to nuance. I would suggest you contact the regional council or the consolidated legal center over that facility and try to open up some kind of dialogue and, and get him the documentation. But if the goal is to get him to a medical center, he's going to have to qualify for meet the criteria for the mental health care level three, in my opinion. So we're getting questions regarding designation. Perhaps we should go to that part of the guide. Which now, let me let me do this real quick because these practice tips are really important on the pre-sentence itself. And that's the next section we're going to get into. Um, well, there was a question on how do you find out how many points the client has for their designation? Well, I'm gonna one of the class one of the classes I'm gonna do in the future is everybody can bring a pre-sentence and we can score people out. You're never gonna really know exactly unless you have a good probation contact. They have the sentry system. They actually could tell you, you know, if somebody's in a pretrial facility and a designation pops in, you know, sometimes you nuance connections with people with sentry terminals. You're really not going to find out. The person himself can ask, uh, you know, some staff are better than others. You, you know, there's a lot of indifference going on right now, but a good case manager in a pretrial facility, he will tell a person, he won't say where you're going. It's a security issue. It's like a BOP taboo, but they will say something like, you know, you're a medium and you have 17 points, you know, I mean, so it, that is difficult to find out ahead of time. Once they're designated, they're entitled to a copy of what's called a BP 337. That's the designation security designation data that will have a breakdown of the points for, upon initial designation. And then after that, the BOP loads what's called the BP 338, a male custody classification form. You will hear about that in the, in the guise of, Pattern, that's Bravo. The Bravo system, uh, a lot of that Bravo data, the BP338 transfers over to Pattern, many of those data points. So, but people are given copies of the BP338 with the points breakdown, public safety factors, management variables all the time. It's a central file section two document. So how, uh, there's been another question. Uh, this is, uh, an anecdote also from Florida. I have asked for recommendation as close as possible to Tampa because of specific family members. Uh, all three should have been classified. 
uh, to mediums. Um, however, they were sent to penitentiaries. What can I do to get them changed and closer to Florida where they're homeless? You're assuming they had they had to go to media. You're assuming it's medium, but if they're sitting in a pen right now, you simply have to get a copy of the BP three thirty eight, or if it's not seven months have gone by, it's the BP three thirty seven, because then you have to meticulously attack why they are scored inaccurately, and that's where we get the nuances on the unknown dispositions. Uh, you know, just say just say. Just say there was a robbery charge and it's an unknown disposition. That's going to result in a serious detainer. Like, I don't know what the scoring is, maybe seven points or five points alone. So in other words, those kind of condition, those kind of things are based on, you know, po probably faulty scoring, but it's not even wrong scoring because of the discretion they have to assign points to things like that until they're clear that there's nothing pending things like that. So you really have to attack the actual data and why the data is wrong and, uh, you know, go from there, really. So I think I can answer this question. Do CJA panel attorneys have the ability to hire uh, an expert such as yourself to provide a BOP scoring before the person is sent? Absolutely. I love doing it, man. That's one of my favorite things is the uh, People think about consultants after sentencing and it's like way too late. I want to get involved at a plea. We want to proactively manage all these things. When I look at a draft pre-sentence report, I do a report on it. Sometimes I testify. Sometimes I do a declaration. A lot of times you don't need a declaration if it's a typical case. But if it's an unusual case, I'll give you another analogy of, of like a really good mitigating type case. First time older female offender never did a day in jail care level three and these are all things you could assess during the really the you know the prosecution before sentencing um and so the mitigation you get on something like that and these are like usually borderline the judges on the fence about a custodial term non-custodial term so now you 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 basically paint this picture the female doctor on a white collar case living in New Jersey who would ordinarily go to a camp because of the medical condition is going to go to Carswell, Texas, and they're going to be with higher security females because it's an administrative facility that services all security levels. They're going to be away from their family. You know, what does stress do on certain conditions? And so like you paint this picture, it's just a reality. There's only, you know, that's where they're going to go to do their time. Female Medical Center, Carswell, Texas. And they, so somebody who's never spent a foot in day in jail, that's pretty profound. And to me, a judge looking at that who's on the fence of custodial term or not, you know, the separation from the family, the distance, the highest security environment, they're all ap applicable factors that warrant a declaration on a case like that. The case I'm talking about actually was a non-custodial case. And it was like... Oh. 20 some I think the 20 some minimum month guideline actually too. So just uh, for the panel member here, I recently used Jack here in Maryland on a federal case. Uh oh. And <laughs> and uh, the judge approved it, him as a mitigation specialist, and I just used the base amount, and he can he can give you all the particulars about his rates, etc. Um, here's another question, and I think it's a good question because. Uh, it's, a, it's a baseline question. Where do we get forms from? But who do we request the PB 337 from? And where to- Yeah, listen, this, <laughs> this, is, this is what you're going to run into. I always recommend you get them from the client because the pure policy on all this is their disclosable files, their central file documents, and clients should be able to put a request in electronic or even the old written cop-outs they call request a staff member and get forms. What I'm finding lately, and even the last few years, I don't know if it's due to staff training, some of it's indifference. There's places where they ask for the forms, they have them in a day or two, and then there's places that say, you can't have that form. And it's just wrong. So now your client's in a very difficult position because I tell them, don't fight. I always say, don't get down to their level. Um, don't fight with them because you win the battle, you lose the war. So now you're, you know, maybe the attorney could reach out. You know, you want to try to protect the client. 
but it's a, it's an issue right now. The BOP is not, in my opinion, uh, consistently providing documents and all the policy is very clear unless it meets a FOIA exempt uh, criteria, they get it. The BOP central file is six sections with a privacy folder. The case manager has a stamp. If they meet one of those FOIA exclusions, it says FOI exempt. They stamp it, they put it in the privacy folder, and then the person can have it. But there's very strict criteria on that. So like the classification form you're asking for, the pattern data, you know, that's all just innocuous, you know, not harmful data that they should be able to get. I know that's a long explanation, but they should be able to get it from the person in prison. And then maybe sometimes you would nuance. I always am big on having you establish relationships with either the consolidated legal center people, attorney to attorney, professional courtesy, or maybe the general counsel attorney to attorney, because you'll get a better level of professionalism. And if you can, in a non-adversarial way, say, listen, my client wants his custody classification, BP 338, and they're not giving it to them. They'll give it to them because they have to. You know, I get them all the time. It's just, you got some places that are just operating independently and it's against policy. So it's a combination of working with uh, case managers and or uh, general counsel's office. Here we have the Mid-Atlantic region, but there are different general counsels around the country. And you could do your FOIA request too. Like, I mean, like that's like the least. A lot of people just go right to a FOIA request. Hopefully everybody's executing the certification of identity form, the DOJ form. I recommend that all the time. That's another issue. The BOP won't honor that form, but it's a DOJ form for that purpose. So they're going to get one of those forms and they're going to go ahead and execute their own consent form, which is, you've probably seen them. It's on the BOP website. They have their own little internal BOP form. Some people will not, or some people will not honor the DOJ one. Some people will. There's not a lot of consistency in the agency right now. So this gets back to access to counsel. And in the letter, we suggested that clients be able to have laptops or access to this guide so they could understand the BOP forms. There is another question regarding pattern scoring. In the pattern scoring questionnaire, does history of violence mean violence since entering the BOP or violence uh, or violent history while out? Both. Both. They're scoring from incident reporters. The BOP scores violence regardless of if it was in the community or in the facility. And, they, and that is an also a data point. That's one of the data points I referenced. The pattern score violence is going to coincide with the BP338 violence. If you go line by line with a pattern risk, a pattern assessment, you're going to notice that I'm just picking a number out of the sky, like eight or 10 of those pattern data points come directly from Bravo. It's actually the, co the computer systems are communicating. The case managers can't even go in there and manipulate the data. They can manipulate Sentry, the 338, but they cannot manipulate Pattern. Pattern has been designed that at their six-month program review, they hit a button and their hands are tied. But they could manipulate Sentry, um, but most of those data points are Bravo from the 338. Bravo is the BP338 male custody classification form. And as Lisa Wayne, thank you, Lisa, pointed out, um, in most jurisdictions, if the expert services, uh, you, you can get them if it's below 600. And she indicates she tries to get the scoring at the front end before a plea. Absolutely. Which is absolutely true. Let me let me raise a good point on that issue, because that's that's been happening more recently <laughs> with me lately. Sometimes I get contacted to answer specific questions about unique cases like sex offenders, maybe gang cooperators. And they say, can you answer these four questions? I'm more at liberty to run a little farther with how I answer those questions than I do in declarations. In a declaration, I'm very conservative. Uh, I'm very cautious. Uh, but if I'm just answering an attorney's questions, you know, I, I'm not saying it's not accurate information. It's definitely accurate, but I, I, I don't, I, I'm more conscious on a, on a court sworn declaration. So sometimes they use the answers to my questions to bring to the prosecutor to really like get the best deal possible. And then I do a declaration, you know, for the sentencing as well, you know, based on the PSR data, you have to, you have to, uh, 
you know, score them from the PSR draft. And that's when you have to clean up. Let me just say this, because these are extremely important points. You have a very small window when that draft is issued. We don't want things in an addendum. You want things corrected. And so I use this example, extortion. Let's take extortion. White collar guy, read the pre-sentence. You know, the BOP has two types of extortion. They have financial and they have threats. So I had a, 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 a guy, if you read the pre-sentence and the conservative approach they take, I would have scored him and I, I felt the BOP would have scored him as the violent extortion threats because there was some overt acts from a, a big case, unrelated co-defendants that they clearly established ahead of time had nothing to do with him, but the but the but the verbiage was in his pre-sentence. And one thing you have to be extremely aware of is that the BOP assigns the instant offense behavior based on the whole case and not just what the plea is to. So you could plead to a simple possession of drugs, but if there's like some gang activity and they whack some witnesses, I don't care if you think it's like oh, three point offense. No, it's seven because they're looking at the overall offense behavior. So the bottom line on this particular case, I like to use real world cases. We, we, because it was established, the attorney was able, because we jumped on it as soon as the draft was issues, the attorney got rid of all the language about the, the threat extortion and, you know, like limited it to just, just to his role in the financial extortion. That's the difference between uh, seven points and a public safety factor, greatest severity that put somebody automatically behind a fence, no matter how many points they have and a five point extortion. And then no public safety factor, so long as they don't score, uh, you know, 11 points or, or yeah, or 12 points, then they're in a camp. And so th those are big things. And then the last thing it probably went in and out of my head. I wanted to say on that was um, uh, it went in and out of my head, but well, there's, there's I, issues. There is another, there's another question. Um, it kind of ties in. It's relating to a PSR. So we're backing up a little bit, but. For matter under other arrests in the PSR, does BOP treat no court reported information the same as unknown disposition and consider either a detainer for security classification purposes? Yeah, well, I, I just mentioned that. An unknown disposition is a kiss of death. You know, here's, a, here's, here's the context you have to understand. When designations were processed in the six regional offices, you had experienced correctional program staff that were like case managers for many years, they would look at a case and they like the example I used was a 1980 simple assault in Atlantic city. They would look at something like that and they had the discretion not to score that the policy does not require it. They use, they broaden their discretion. So a seasoned correctional programs person would probably not score that. Now, fast forward, the grand Prairie, Faster, cheaper, better was the, was the analogy when they developed Grand Prairie. And then they hired a lot of data entry people to put some of this preliminary data in. You were not getting seasoned correctional program staff scoring these classifications. Now, there's a review authority. There's an operation manager. But I'm just telling you is that one of my jobs when I worked in the agency was to monitor the incoming pipeline and rescore people. And when Grand Prairie came about, the scoring got atrocious, in my opinion. And we'd have to divert people. We'd have to, you know, it's it's in my opinion, it's 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 not done like it should be done. So uh, the point on that was you want nothing ambiguous. Here's another one people don't realize: the instant offense is committed while on a period of supervision. Well, we're going to resolve the the two. Just say they're both feds. One might not be a fed. Oh, there's going to be an assumption. He pleads guilty to the federal and the state's going to resolve itself. <laughs> That's still going to be a detainer, to be honest with you. And, you know, you have to make sure you're telegraphing this, that there is nothing else coming officially. Like you can't just say it's going to not be there. It has to be done. It's a done deal. If they resolve everything, it's sentencing a, a federal violation and a federal sentence. You got to make sure that data those dispositions get officially to Grand Prairie or into the EDES database through probation. Uh, so they have that updated record. Uh, the more common scenario is a state case. And now he does a federal, he's on state supervision. He does a federal crime. And now that state thing is just out there, even though they're going to dismiss it, that's being scored. Unless you could rid him out from the county jail as a holdover and resolve it. That's the other little nuances. When I talked about 
you know, detainers before. There's a lot of nuances to detainers. Sometimes when somebody's in local custody, and I think, Pat, we were talking about this with a case, you mm -hmm. literally have somebody come and borrow them and then bring them back and get like a one day court appearance, you know, and every jurisdiction has their nuances, how to work things like that out, but that will haunt them. So I, I don't know if you're aware, but there's a large list serve of federal defenders and they don't, they would like an updated list, a regional council list. Uh, I presume we can provide that to them. No, let me, let me tell you that the, that comprehensive legal guide I talked about at the very beginning I'm not saying the names are totally up to date. Oh uh, yeah, go to the last page of that, Pat. That's the first link I said to have on your desk. Go to the very end. Just hit, yeah, there you go. Oh, it was there. Right here, okay, you got two pages here. Go up a little bit more first. Okay, here, let me see. No, no, the right, no, go up. I wanna see that one. No, no, the one you were just on. There's a consolidated legal center and then there's a regional council. Let me see. I have a different one. Let me see if this one, this is, let me see the one I have. I don't know if this is newer or my end's newer. Um, Richard Winter. Uh, these are, I have one that I thought was newer, which is all the same names. Sometimes well, we, can, we can circulate that. But the numbers are good. Remember that, you know, the people could change in the chairs, but all these numbers and fax numbers and things are good. So here's your regional council and I'll go to the next page. Now, these are your consolidated legal centers. The BOP is big on chain of command. I'm big on chain of command. I tell the people in prison, you start out with the line staff, then you go to the unit manager, then you go to the associate warden, then you go to the warden. So like your attorneys, I still say you give the courtesy to the consolidated legal center first before you go to the region because that creates animosity you know like somebody would run to the warden and the warden would say did you see the unit manager and what you know why are you coming right to me it, it kind of causes some adversarial relationship so if there's no attorney on site there'll be a consolidated legal center and then you know and sometimes the consolidated legal center is the regional office but this these should be good numbers, maybe not good names. So I don't know if, if you had this or not, but this is part of the comprehensive guide that the BOP puts out for attorneys. So there have been times when uh, I have called an, an institution such as West Virginia and no one answers the phone. So there, as everyone knows, there's a an email address that you can reach out to the warden to get the case manager's name so that you can... Uh, you know, schedule a call with the client or any alternative, I would presume that you could call, and I have done this, general counsel's office, um, or I don't know if these consolidated legal centers could help, but one of the things that we recommended to the BOP was, was a help desk so that we could schedule calls regularly with our clients and, and also schedule the providing of discovery. Um, how do you recommend pursuing removal of offense conduct of other defendants in the PSR? This well, that 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 stems from like the case I was referring to. You get the draft day one. Mm -hmm. Obviously, probation is going to have to remove that mm -hmm. uh, if they feel it doesn't belong. So the merits of it, I don't know what their discretion is. Like I could just tell you the BOP is considering the overall offense behavior is what they've always done. And so maybe they could get it removed. Maybe you can. I'm not saying they'll remove it. I mean, that really depends. This was a cut and dry case because it was a big case, a lot of co-defendants. And like and initially they they separated this person out from the threats intentionally for whatever reason. And so it was easy for us to do that. I'm not saying it's always easy to do that. The, the other things like the wrong zip code, like let's take the unknown dispositions is probably the most common. Unknown or ambiguous dispositions. I like to say, you know, it's really not unknown. I mean, maybe it is unknown, but that's that's laziness by a probation officer. Didn't go a little extra, you know. So, but I do say, if under the unknown, if they can qualify it and say, you know, an NCIC was run and there's no wants warrants regarding to this case, or or something a little extra, or you could get something a little extra from calling that jurisdiction, you know, just something on the record to kind of you know, to, to bring home the point that it's not 
you know, it's not there. There's nothing there. Hey, here's another question that was forwarded. Thank you, Monica. Um, my client is a cult victim and her victimhood is discussed in the PSR and the probation recommendation. She's being treated as a sex offender when she pled to a conspiracy to money launder. They face, uh, this affects her public safety factor and she's being denied core links and a tablet. Is there anything that can be done? It, yeah, there's more than one issue there. First of all, there's a, there's a the, the, the Bible, the, the classification manual uh, policy is a foundational policy, 5100.8. There's a definition of what a sex offender is. If she doesn't meet the definition of a sex offender, then she doesn't need a sex offender public safety factor. A case manager could remove that if he believes or she believes it's not applicable. Unfortunately, the definition is so broad, there's not even a requirement for a conviction when you look at the BOP policy. Is it legal, not legal? I can't judge that. I could just say that's the first place you start. 5100.8, go to the definition of sex offender public safety factor and see if they would remove it. And that's a, I, I don't usually recommend the remedy pro, uh, procedures because it's like banging your head on the wall. But I do say in situations like that, if you feel it clearly is not appropriate, they will remove those public safety factors. The next one's a little trickier, um, not trickier, you know, you have what's called Walsh Act assignments, too, that kind of coincide with some of these sex offender cases or anybody knows about the Walsh Act computer assignment, CMA case management assignment. What happens is if somebody has a public safety factor in a Walsh Act assignment, the trust fund computer system automatically disconnects the function of email automatically. So that's got to be reviewed and turned on, so to speak. A person arriving in a prison already automatically has those capabilities. Those computer like issues turn it off. So now it needs to be reviewed. What I'm finding across the country, and this has a historical context as well as what's going on right now. Right now, I'm seeing people that have been emailing regularly that are sex offenders losing privileges because a new warden rolls in that doesn't believe they should have it. Like all these, I see rogue wardens anymore. Like, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear what I, I know. I'm, I'm on a thing, please. Because I see these, I see these things all the time. So right now I'm experiencing of an increased volume of people that were emailing all along and all of a sudden they turn it off. And then just so you understand this, sometimes staff have a stigma against sex offenders and they're a little indifferent. So they don't really send a recommendation up to turn it on. But it is the trust fund supervisor that needs to, you know, the unit team really needs to contact the trust fund supervisor if they feel they should have, um, you know, privileges. Now, last thing I'll say, because there's a lot to say on that, and there's probably even another issue with all that. The policy language for not allowing uh, email privileges is the trust fund manual. Pat, we have that. That might be a nice learning experience. I don't know if you can find the trust fund manual on this document because we're kind of like Shirley's operating the. Yeah, well, if you could find the trust fund manual, I could show you the exact policy language. And the context was when they first developed this, they were restricting everybody like crazy. And then an internal memo came down, probably. I don't know if it was two, late 2000s and basically said you really shouldn't be restricting all the people. Yeah, go to 4,500. Yeah, go 4,500.12. Go to that. Thank you, Shirley. No, but this is good stuff. This is a very common issue. I deal with this all the time. Sometimes we get it. Sometimes we do a remedy and they 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 change their mind. Can you do? Can you go to text or tools and hit like search a word in here or not? See if you could search SEX. Just see what happens. And now how many hits do we got? Uh, there's a little like, I want to say it's like 800 and something paragraph. This is a very big manual. This is like soup to nuts. 124. Oh, wait. Ooh, oh, there we go. See how quick that was. Look at this. So this is the, this is the policy. Very, it's only a, it's only like very short. Inmates whose offense, conduct, or other personal history indicates a propensity to fend through the email. You know, you could, you read it on. It gets into the Walsh Act assignments that I was talking about. 
And here we go. Prior, permanently restricted from corresponding with individuals who are. So anyway, you have to assess the policy and then challenge the policy based on what the policy says and what the case is. And th that is a situation that you can flip sometimes on a administrative remedy. And a lot of times you flip it at the institution level if they feel they're on weak ground because they don't want the region to read it if they feel like they're outside the scope of policy. So it, it, it appears as though the warden has a lot of uh, clout or power. The warden has a lot of clout, but he's still not above the law. I mean, to be honest with you, like. <laughs> Talk about Hazleton for a minute. In what way? The whistleblower. Well, Hazleton has a, a line established for like whistleblowing. It's blocked from the inmates who are trying to email to it because of all kinds of things going on at Hazleton. There's a, there, there's too many things to Hazleton is imploding right now. And there's like literally lots going on at Hazleton with the medical care, uh, assaults, a lot of, a lot of staff issues. And so there is some kind of a, of a established DOJ a whistleblower line for the public actually to report things about Hazleton right now. So uh, say you have a client that's a medical level three or four, where can you find uh, those designations, those places where they could be designated to because they have either a terminal illness or. Uh... Listen, the medical centers are listed on the BOP website. Uh, historically, it was pretty simple. It was it, medical centers were threes and fours. But because of the shortage of beds and the cost, they what they've done now is they have some non-medical centers that'll house certain care level threes meeting certain criteria that's not really published in the public domain, to be honest with you. Not, not that I'm aware of anywhere. So you have some penitentiaries, a few select penitentiaries that'll take some care level threes, but it, it, ordinarily, historically, Threes and fours are medical centers. And and in talking, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have a follow-up presentation with the doctor who is a former BOP employee. And just yes, that's a good question for the doctor, actually, to kind of give us. She just retired this month, so she's fresh. Right. She, she's right off the – she still needs to be deprogrammed. She's still BOP mind. Well, in, and in talking with her, one of the things that I, I think will help in medical care is telemedicine because the, the doctors aren't there 24 seven often. Um, can you talk, there was a- Let me say this, Pat, I apologize, but these ideas I have to get out because it's important and then I'll, I'll be quiet. That's all right. um, one thing that's really true from an inside perspective with medical people, they are extremely understaffed with clinicians to the point where there is no doctor at some facilities at all. You have, you're taking doctors from one facility to cover other facilities, which means they're leaving their facilities. And there's, you know, I'll use the word crisis because former BOP assistant directors use that word before crisis levels of staffing for medical care. That all becomes mitigating. When I do a declaration, I don't get into clinical. Uh, I'm not clinical but I do go into the inspector general reports that talk about what's going on, the GAO reports, my observations, what I'm dealing with around the country. So I'm, I'm very comfortable talking about, you know, and when COVID was there and they had that Venters guy running around, like doing scathing reports about Brooklyn shredding cop outs for medical treatment. Like that's all documented data by the government. A lot of this medical issues become very mitigating on an initial sentence, especially when, the, you know, you're on the fence about a custodial term or not. Like, really, like, the, the, it's not a good state right now of the agency. And back in Florida, uh, we passed, the board passed a resolution regarding Bureau of Prisons oversight, which I think uh, by a, a non-BOP board or advisory committee or an ombudsman, and I think it's a, it's time has come. Um there was a question. I know we're going to get into First Step Act down the road, but can you just address the difference between the, the good and the earned time credits? Uh, there was a question about that. Listen, this changes with the wind. And the easiest way to explain this, because the cases have been the 2241s are flying. I'm surprised this hasn't been resolved months ago. However, 
what's what what's been happening other than the calculator tool constantly changing and having glitches you know that i could prove by data that i have because I, I i see these printouts and things uh the big issues right now are people are earning the one year maximum if you look at a bop sentence computation people who release with just a 15 percent good conduct time the computer gives them a gct space rel gct release method once they start earning the first step back credits that changes to a fsa space rel so it becomes a statutory release date and when they get one year's worth of credits that's the max so now you have a one year earlier kind of like a 3621e date with the rdaps you have a one year earlier fsa release now they're accumulating what's called pre-release credits, home detention or halfway house. What's going on now all over the country, the cases are out there. I could cite I could cite a case right now that's interesting that there was a filing the other day. Uh, S-R-E-E-D-H-A-R, Sridhar Patarazu, P-O-T-A-R-A-Z-U. What's happening is that they are submitting people for the amount of pre-release credits they've earned and the RRMs, the residential reentry managers that uh, finalize the placement date, they're either not responding or they're reducing placements because they don't have the bed space. So it becomes is the first step act pre-release credits. Is that statutory or not? I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I look at that as like statutory time it's earned. And I think the language in the law is shall and so you have people right now that should be in the halfway house or home detention by the credits earned that's documented in the computer. They were basically being told there's no beds. And when they filed the 2241s, what's been happening is all of a sudden the BOP sends them out and now it's moot. And so like, that's only going to last for so long, in my opinion. Um, you know, they have to resolve this issue, but it's a very big issue. They had years to plan for this. They had years to budget it. The budget, the bill had to be scored. So like, I can't understand at this early stage why we're in this predicament, but we were in this predicament in 07 with the second chance act. Now that was not statutory, but anybody that was practicing around 07, 08, when they increased the eligibility from six to 12 months, halfway house under the second chance act, they literally were given a lot of people 12 months initially. And what do you think happened? They ran out of beds. Then there was years when I had, I didn't see a 12 month placement, but that was not statutory. That was the second chance act is discretionary. And then the last thing I'll say on all this, when the BOP recently did the change notice on the time credits program statement, it's very clear that the statutory credits I'm talking about is above and beyond any second chance act placement. So people are not only not getting the credits they've earned, they're not getting any second chance act placement. That's a huge conundrum that the agency is in right now. Thank you for that. Um, there is one other very important issue that I wanted to discuss. Uh, our committee is working uh, proudly with the Women in Criminal Defense Committee um, to deal with women and corrections. Um, could you briefly, Jack, address uh, some of the research that you have found and that uh, some of the facility where the facilities are that can house and, and treat females in particular. Well, I'll go back. One, one thing I didn't really talk about at all yet is that you, you need to learn the BOP as a phenomenal website. I mean, you have to get beyond the PR and the homepage and everything, but it's, it's not easy to navigate, but once you navigate it, it's, it's, it's really good site. Um, so there's a whole female offender section on there, which has the female offender program manual, all the female facilities, you know, you go to the first step back uh, guide for the programs and there it's, you know, being updated regularly. There's an October, we have a link to it, the October, we have a link to everything I just mentioned actually on our guide, but there's an October 23 first step back program guide. You know, they have that fit program, 
uh, female integrated treatment at Danbury, and they have it more than just Danbury, but there are residential programs based on the female offender population. Uh, the BOP does have a female offender section within the central office. Uh, at one point, it was Dr. Alex McLaren, but I believe she moved. I'm not sure who's in charge of that section now. So, Pat, I don't know what else other than, you know, the facilities for females is on the web. The policy, core policy is there. It's like a soup to nuts manual. And um, anything else specifically, Pat? Or? No, I just I just wanted to point that out and, and stay tuned because we're going to be doing some continued work with women in criminal defense on this issue. And, and there's scathing, scathing reports in the last few days. Like I I'm I look at BOP stories every day. I'm in tune to different, you know, Marshall Project stories and stuff. But again, there was just another scathing, I want to say it was Tallahassee issue about sexual abuse and stuff. These things are and these things are mitigating. I mean, I did a declaration on a female who was traumatized in the community and taken advantage of and had PTSD and they designated her to like, I forget which one it was, the rape club out in uh, Dublin or whatever. And so, you know, like that's impactful for a judge to, to be considering putting people, you know, in facilities when they really don't have their, their, their house in order at this point in time. So uh, here's a question. The BOP policy seems to pr uh, prohibit good time on a sentence less than a year. That's absolutely true. A person who does a year and a day does less time than the person who gets sentenced to a year. Uh, one thing on the positive side, the first step back credits can be accumulated for people on sentence of less than a year. So if that's a bright side, a year is a year, you do 365. If you get first step back credits off that, be happy. So usually when I see a year, it means the judge was not happy with the person. <laughs> the judges ordinarily give a year and a day in almost every case. And once in a blue moon, you run across the one year, there has to be some kind of a contentious prosecution, or maybe the judge thought he was giving them a break. I don't know. I can't get into individual cases, but it's not common to get 12 months. Um, on compassionate release, the IRA, which is the youth reduction and the, um, um, Second Look Act, one of the things we've been discussing in the committee is obtaining records. Uh, and do you have any suggestions of the best way to obtain BOP records, like the medical records, the disciplinary records, oh. pattern scores, et cetera? Yeah. Pat, I don't know if you could circulate it to everybody, but Allison Guernsey came up with a good uh, guidance that developed with, I think, in conjunction with them and FAM and this was all during COVID, which was like kind of like expedited procedures. So we had talked about that at a previous correction committee meeting. Um, so that's something if you could circulate to people or maybe that's a good thing to put on. Actually, you know, that was a recent meeting. So we should, probably should put that within our guide. Uh -huh. my, my, my advice is always like when you're talking IRAA, I work a lot of the juvenile life or IRAA cases. That discovery is set by the chief judge and the local. So we always get we always get like a core amount of great discovery automatically. And then when I look at the data, I'll say, oh, try to get the blah, blah, blah. But like we get the 338s, we get, you know, we get the the program review reports, the progress reports, the education transcript, the disciplinary chronological. Sometimes I want other things. And that's when I say the person in prison, if that's who gets it. Because you don't want to float through a prosecutor. You want to get it directly from the client. You could reach out to the government and say you want this. But I say, sometimes I'll look at it and I'll say, no, I don't want it through the government. I want it from him or not at all. And so you get it from the client. You know, there's policy on all this. And, uh, you know. So so Beth Blackwood, who is, who is uh, works for NACDL and First Step Act and, and Compassionate Release, is the, she said it's the NACDL FAM uh, protocol and she will circulate it. Uh, and she said it is much harder to get other BOP records. Yeah. Good case managers move mountains, uh, to be honest with you, because the policy is crystal clear that they're entitled to these records. Now, you might meet a little delay and everything like that, but you really, you know, and I say case manager, a lot of people don't realize a counselor is not what you think when you hear counselor. 
Counselors are glorified correction officers. If you look at their position classification, in parenthesis, it says correctional officers. They're uniform staff. They're kind of like a, a special correction officer. So they're not really trained in all the intricate case management stuff. The case manager, which is in parentheses, correctional treatment specialist, you know, college degree required. They're trained in all these areas. You know, their professional series, the numerical position by OPM regulations. So like I'm always hearing about, oh, the counselor said this or the counselor said that. Sometimes people mix up counselor and case manager interchangeably. That's OK. But you really need to know who you're talking to, even with unit managers. A unit manager could be a captain or a, a, a lieutenant who came up through custody, being an officer, a GS8 officer and a lieutenant. He might have absolutely no clue. They wouldn't even know what pattern stood for or SPARK 13, or all these acronyms, they wouldn't even know what it stood for. So you have to be careful who you're working with too on the team. Like the counselor said he can't have it or the counselor didn't give it to him. No, it's the case manager. So um, Shirley, if we could just go back up, I, I just wanna go backwards a little bit to the interactive map. And I just point this out for those of you that are new to the organization. During COVID, we had, uh, the corrections committee had sent out a survey monkey uh, we, we ask questions regarding prison jail communications. Um, and in uh, we, we received a number of responses, including anecdotal information as to what's going on around the country uh, regarding prison jail communications. And it's a huge issue. Within the map, and surely you hopefully can point to it, but there, there is a way for you to send us information in the future regarding if you have if you're having issues in your jurisdiction uh, with the BOP and surely put it in the um, the chat. Uh, so we would love to hear from you. We we want to gather uh, more information regarding prison jail communications because, as I mentioned in the introduction, access to counsel is huge not only access to counsel, but access to documents, pre-trial, trial, and sentencing. Um, and as Jack just pointed out, that is, where, that is where the case managers come in, where the general counsel's office comes in, because often we can't reach our client and the only way to do it is to go to general counsel or to the case manager. And some are reluctant. And the mail has been also very bad in terms of uh, getting into uh, getting mail delivered to our clients and having it done confidentially. And as you know, the, the reason laptops are important is because of the volumes of documents you get in evidence and the client has a right to look at it all. So um, I, I don't know if you could hover over an example. Uh, okay, here's another question. Um, besides 337 and 338, what are the docs we should ask client to prepare for sentencing? Well, for sentencing, you're not going to have a 338. I'm, I'm sorry, to get to prepare for resentencing. Re, no, resentencing big. Um, I have a I have a discovery wish list I send around. Pat, if you remind me, I would float it to the group. Um, you know, your education transcript, it's a, a referred to as a P to PED. Uh, you want to, you could actually have a work history of PP37 or run a history of anything. WRK will show you every job that person's ever had. That might be difficult to get. I do see them. Uh, it's a harmless document, but technically it's not a central file document. So, you know, if you're going through a prosecutor and they can get it, it's fine. Like it's part of the normal DC discovery I get. But so you have to understand it's a wish list. What I send around okay. work history, education transcript. 337, 338, um, program review report, progress report, Beamer and PDS records. We haven't even talked about, you know, important Bureau of Electronic Medical Records, which a lot of people know about with COVID, but PDS, psychology data system records, extremely important. A lot of good mitigation comes out of those records, the clinical psychology contacts. So since Shirley took the time, why don't you go into just Marilyn, what you just did, Shirley, if you don't mind. And Monica said the discovery wish list will be sent along with other program materials, but perhaps this would be a, a good time regarding the access to documents would be a good time to do another uh, survey monkey or some questionnaire to find out what is actually going on. Because I know in the committee, we've had this real time discussion about 
um, uh, FOIA and how they uh, circumvent that process. So, uh, oh, here's a, another. I'm retired district judge in Texas, now practicing criminal defense, but I'm still a member of the National Association of Women Judges. I am on NAWJ, um, uh, Women in Prison Committee. My email is, and that is wonderful. Thank you, Susan, Chris, from Chris in Rousseau, Rousseau Law. And uh, we will reach out to you uh, and look forward to it. And we'd love to have you join our committee. By the way, people are welcome to come. Your your input and feedback is is necessary for our successful um, progress on all of these issues that we've discussed today. Uh, and uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion and hopefully improving on all of the systems and uh, reform that is necessary to make it. Um, are you saying we're coming to an end, Pat? Well, I don't know. Do you have something else you want? Well, no, listen, I have stuff we could talk all day, but there's so a couple of notes I'd like to, if you have the time. I don't know. I'm not paying attention to the time. There's a couple of things I had pre-training uh, notes that I think are important people would but, want to hear. Okay, and, sure. I just wanted to thank um, Judge Chris for her reaching out. So we definitely will reach out to you. So go ahead, Jack. Um, you just mentioned the legal calls. And one thing context is extremely important and what i'm noticing lately which everybody should keep in mind because I'm, I'm seeing it more and more is that a person asks for a legal call and then they're even putting it in writing you need to prove an eminent court deadline i want everybody to be very clear the only time you have to prove an eminent court deadline is and if you read the policy the intent of the policy it's when people are asking for repeated calls so I'm dealing with people, they ask one time for one call and they say, well, you need to prove an eminent court deadline. It's totally misrepresentation of the policy intent. I'm not sure what the CFR, how it covers that, but people need to know that because half the time the person in prison doesn't know better. They just go away, you know, and and, and they're even putting it in writing because I'd save two of them uh, to, to attorneys that they need to prove a deadline. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not pretty. Um, and then Something else I wanted to say is when we're talking about designations, the teams, there's a false assumption that, you know, the team that does your jurisdiction does the designation. So a lot of times you're trying to call the team. I have Charlie team for my district. No, the teams are assigned to the district, do the initial load data on the BP 337 designation data form. But the designation is actually completed by hotel team. They must have had a sense of humor when they called it hotel initially, but only the hotel team does designations other than witness security cases. And then there's certain input from the West Virginia gang unit when we're talking about those things. Uh, we really have to talk in the future about all this gang issues and dropout yards and a lot of these things that aren't really defined in policy and in the public domain because there's a lot of serious things to know about when it comes to you know, dropout yards, keeping people safe, gang designations, security threat group assignments, things like that. So we haven't we haven't scratched that. And I apologize. I wanted to. to and we that. just and we did just get another question almost to that end. We're uh, if we're coming to an end, do you have any tips on helping defendants slated for deportation in sentencing to a facility? Well, well, this is this deportation issue is really big right now with the first step back credits because what's happening is. When the, when the BOP changed the policy fairly recently, technically, without a final order of deportation, people are able to earn the first step back credits if they qualify in the other ways. So what's been happening lately is that the BOP is awarding a year and then they're taking it away. And they're taking it away because they're getting these ICE uh, expedited removal orders. And the legal question, and I'm not a lawyer, is that a final order of deportation? Because ICE is one agency, and then under Homeland Security, they're under Homeland Security, and then you have the Executive Office of Immigration Review. So I've had three people lately had a year off. They say they're not deportable. I don't know if they are or they're not. And the BOP gave them the year off, took it back, 
the most recent one a couple of weeks ago, they transferred him to Allenwood Low, which is what's called an institution hearing program site where they do hearings. So this person gets there and now he needs a hearing. Well, what's a final order of deportation? So they're, I think they're, and they're keying in the computer, a CMA assignment, final order of deportation. So my question is, why is a person keying in the computer as and taking good time back if he has to still get a hearing? So that's going on right now. That's another big issue. Well, we could probably go on for <laughs> for hours, but we we appreciate all of your participation and uh, your excellent questions, and we'll keep this dialogue going. 